Yeah. <laughs> I'm Philip Hands. Um, I'm talking about OpenQA. Uh, it's mostly an excuse to get me to actually do something about OpenQA for the last month so that uh, I've got something to show you. But actually, it didn't really work out because there's a bug in OpenQA, which means that the thing that I wanted to demonstrate doesn't work. But I've worked out that I, didn't, I shouldn't be telling you about that anyway because it would waste your time and my time. So, win. <laughs> okay, so OpenQA is a thing for um, getting some system, normally a VM, looking at it somehow, normally VNC, uh, typing things at it at the appropriate moments, clicking on things when it recognizes stuff, and just persuading it to go through some set of tests so that at the end of it you see a result and you go, that's a success. So then, and it sort of it indirectly proves that your software is working. It's pretty simple-minded. It looks It's normally looking at little fragments of screenshots and trying to match them with things it remembers. And it throws quite a lot of the detail away to make it more likely to match so that it's not worrying about slight changes of the shade of blue on the back of, uh, of GNOME. Um, this is uh, the talk that I gave at DevConf uh, 21. If you want lots of details, there are lots of details. So if you're wanting to write new tests, it's tempting to try and write them on the, the live system, but um, yeah. Well. <laughs> um, but actually, that's a mistake. You want to run the test and the VM and everything on your laptop or your local system, because then you can uh, cycle through the, the screens much faster and edit things and rerun the tests, and it just makes everything go much quicker. So the first thing you want to do is install OpenQA locally. Uh, you can do it direct. I, I just installed it straight on my laptop, which means that you uh, oh, shouldn't be doing that, should I? Because it doesn't go on the. So you should be uh, doing this bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry about this. I can't actually see my screen. <laughs> um, or you can run it in a VM, obviously. Uh, and uh, Roland uh, has done this, and he's got lots of nice notes about all the things that you need to do in addition. Uh, there, you have to set up Apache by uh, having a, a virtual host for that to to go via to get to the uh, the user interface, which is a website. Um, so, yeah, if uh, if people do that and they have trouble doing it, then please talk to me about it because I'm trying to make the package be more helpful, and it's not that helpful at the moment. But it, it's uh, only about five extra steps that you have to do after uh, installing the package. Um, then. Normally, there's a fake user called Geeko test, and the tests live in a subdirectory under var lib openqa. If you're doing stuff on your local machine, you probably want it somewhere under your home to have the tests, and the uh, openqa that won't follow a link out of var, var lib to your home directory, and if you try and do it that way, it doesn't really work. So I use a, a bind mount to make it so that the files are really under my home directory, but it looks to OpenQA as if it's under its, its directory. And then you have to get both you and Geeko test to be able to write to that. So I create a Geeko test uh, shared user. I don't know if that's really the right way of doing it. You could sudo to Geeko test, or you know, there are various ways of doing it. So if people come up with nicer ways of doing it, Fair enough, or I can explain my slightly mad scheme for doing it and make it more like that if everybody standardizes on that. Uh, I should probably talk to the OpenQA folk. To, uh, you um, were saying that they were advising uh, their users internally about, you know, so I'll take some inspiration from that and write it up somewhere. So, to write a test, uh, you need to grab a hold, hold a copy of our tests, which are on Salsa. And then if you're wanting to, you're probably wanting to run something on the desktop rather than, almost all the tests that are in there are actually about installing Debian. And I install every desktop uh, four times a day via 
uh, BIOS and UEFI. And it's quite complicated because the uh, installer can present you with prompts in different orders depending on whether you're doing network booting or not and things like that. So that code is actually quite complicated compared with what you normally test, which is start a program, see if the first screen looks okay, type something or click something, see if the second screen looks okay. So that sort of test is, uh, there are a few of those in the, uh, the repository, one of which is checking out that desktop printing works, which what it actually does is print a PDF and check that the PDF looks right afterwards. Uh, so I've, yesterday I took that, threw away most of it because I didn't care about installing cups. Uh, and turned it into something that tests whether it can start Emacs up. Uh, so we got that, which you can't read, which is great. <laughs> so that is the whole test, and most of it is something that I copied from somewhere else. So the bits where it says Emacs are the bits that I, I edited. So the first bit is the standard intro -y bit, which uh, is a little bit paranoid here, because it's just started the system up from a hard disk boot and it's making sure that things like when it's first booted sometimes it puts up a little thing telling you that you need to do an update or something so it waits a while for the screen to settle down before saying carry on with the next bit because otherwise when you pop up a window it pops up another window on top uh, then uh, where it says apt yeah, there, right, there we go. So I did that bit, okay? <laughs> so that's the first bit of editing you have to do, is actually say what you want to test and make sure it's installed. Uh, then you actually, oh, and that does that, I mean, the clever bit either side of that is getting onto a text console and then coming back to the, the uh, desktop console or the, the, uh, the, the one that's running X so that you don't have to worry about looking for differences between the installer on KDE or GNOME. It does, it, it does the installing on the text. Uh, then it's doing Alt F2 and Emacs to run Emacs. Then um, this is a thing to make sure that you're not still on the text console because sometimes it doesn't work. And so if you spot that you're still on the text com console at this point, it just fails. Uh, then the next bit that I wrote to make a test is this, which is I just made something up. It's not a keyword or anything. Uh, and it's meant to be when you start Emacs, you get this sort of logo and stuff. And it's going to look for that. So that's called a needle. And it's called a needle because uh, OpenQA is looking for needles in haystacks. So it's looking through all the images that it sees flashing past and trying to match them with that. Now, you'll note that that isn't a graphic. So that doesn't do anything yet. But when you get into the user interface, it'll say, I can't find it because it doesn't exist. And then it types uh, Alt-X and Hanoi, which runs the towers of Hanoi in Emacs, which is... Uh, something that you definitely need in your editor. And then once it's finished, it looks for the little tower in the middle of the screen. And if it gets that far, you've actually tested quite a lot of things that have to work in Emacs and GNOME and all the rest of it without, I mean, I've typed four things. Okay, so if you've got a thing that you need to test and you're very bored because you have to test it every time you upload it and things like that, you could write one of these tests quite quickly. We could add it to openqa.debian.net and then we can, you can have a look for red flags or at some point we'll get it so that it can work out who it is that's responsible for that thing that just broke and send you an email. But I haven't done that yet. Okay, and then there's some stuff at the end, which you can tell it that you don't really care about this job, so don't, uh, don't cancel the whole test just because this bit failed and things like that. Or you can say this is uh, an anchor point and then do a load of tests that keep on going back to the anchor point if they fail. Okay, so once you've, uh, you've done that bit, uh, the easiest way to get a job to run on is to find the thing that you copied and modified into your test and clone a copy of that job. And cloning it with this command here means Go off to uh, to this. 
this job that's just copied out of the URL of when you're looking at the user interface on our instance, and it will get all the things it needs into your instance and, uh, and run it up for you as a new job. Um, with the skip depths bit, it means uh, don't do all the jobs leading up to that, because this one doesn't install before it. Uh, that may or may not be a good idea, uh, because you'll get the installed image instead of the, the .iso that it started from. But um, if you haven't got the same uh, uh, web cache, no, not web cache, uh, yeah, um, apps cache set up as we've got, then it will fail on the install. So I, I think actually you should do it from the start without the skip depths. But there's various options that you can do to change the way that the job runs. That will run a, a job on your, uh, your instance, which will fail because it's got no needles. So then you go into the uh, web interface, and it says, I'm looking for needles. And we can have a look at that, if you like. And there we are. So that should be, is that the job that failed? Yeah. So it's looking for Emacs starting up, which it did find, but it says it failed because it doesn't know what Emacs looks like. So when we look at, when it's looking for that, it hasn't got any examples. So you've got this thing called a needle editor, and you can say that this screen does include that tag and then decide on something that means that you actually got there like you could do uh, this is quite difficult like this well do it a bit better than that and then you go out to the top and save it and it will do a screenshot that screenshot will get saved and these uh, location, this location will get saved, and then it'll know to look for that bit in the next time it runs. Uh, you can do this in developer mode, so while it's running the first time through, you can take over the test, and when it fails to uh, to find anything, you can actually do this edit in the middle of the test running and say carry on, and then it'll go on to the next thing. So if you're adding lots of needles, it's better to do that, and that's a real that's really much quicker if you're doing it on your laptop than if you're doing uh, doing it remotely. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and then once you've put all the needles in, uh, then, then it actually finds that there instead. And then when it's finished, it's got some extra st stuff that's part of this job that collects, um, oh no, it actually hasn't, I'm lying. So it gets to that one, which is the end of uh, the thing. Uh, I think that's that. So how are we doing? How much time have I got? No, five minutes. OK, um, and... So then we've got a templates file that takes, uh, you just put a couple of parameters, like the fact that you're trying to run this desktop Emacs test into uh, a template, and I can load, it. once I've got your change, I can load that into the thing that controls the whole system, and the next time that uh, an ISO gets uploaded, it'll add that test to the set of tests that get run. Um, and then, you know, I can include your tests in uh, in the tests and everybody's happy. Uh, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Does anyone have any questions so far? So I can... Should we do... Uh, have you already found some bugs with that? Yeah, and uh, we found some bugs where someone else had found the bug at the same time and it added a bit of extra information to the bug or made it easier for other people to see what the problem was, and a few bugs where nobody had noticed the bug at all. So it's already doing useful stuff. Uh, yeah, when you've got a broken job like that, you can um, restart it. And I'll give you something to look at while you're thinking of something to ask me. 
So this is what it actually does. And it's quite boring, which is why I didn't do it in the uh, talk, because it sits there doing nothing quite a lot of the time. Yes? So does it always go through the installation process? Um, this, this is starting from a hard disk image. Ah, OK. So, so uh, the normal job starts off by trying to get to the first menu. And if it fails, then it's almost always on the second menu. If that's failed, it's almost always because the kernel mismatch things happening because the kernel upgrades happened. Um, uh, then it does all the installs of different uh, installations. That, the, this is my instance. Uh, the, we're running on uh, OpenQA Debian.net. So it installs loads of them, and it keeps the GNOME one and the XFCE one. And then you can run tests based on that hard drive image afterwards. So you can, you can actually save it at any point. If you've got something which you spend a load of time building something, you can save the... Uh, the images, but obviously the more images you save, the bigger the disks we need. Okay, but it's always running full system simulations, so the, there's no yeah. mode where yeah. I'm yeah, I mean, X frame. It doesn't have to. If you can get some some way of looking at the thing and some way of interacting with it, then you can run it on anything. Yeah, some X frame buffer. Yeah, well, this is, it actually does it via uh, uh, VNC, I think, or maybe Spice. I think it's VNC. Thanks. So that's installing Emacs on the console as root, the root console that it gets you to, which you didn't have to do anything to get. It's sort of already been done. And then uh, it'll go back and do the other bit of the test. So is it also possible to use a console to compare it against instead of this graphical comparison? You can do uh, so. You can you can do a graphical comparison of that's actually doing a graphical comparison of what's on the console. Yeah, of course, but I mean, is it also possible to use a ser the output of a yeah, serial terminal you can, for that? You can connect to the serial port. Mm -hmm. uh, the first serial port on the machine is normally used for interacting with it. By so, when you run scripts uh, on the console, you normally spit out a uh, nonce at the end of the script, which includes the return code of the script, so you can tell whether it worked or not. And that's all done on the first serial port. Uh, so if you want to do it, you, if, you add a, if you have a second serial port on the VM, then you can talk to that, log into that, and then you have to use slightly different scripting. You can't, so you can't have the exact same script running on both, but it's just got a you know, underscore serial at the end of the same command. You know? OK, thanks. Uh, it also does have stuff in it for doing uh, OCR, so you could probably OCR this and have it look for it. Is it actually working? Or have I? Oh, I didn't actually update. It. Yeah, but it still hasn't got the uh, the ne needles because I deleted them so that the other test would work. So now, because it hasn't got the needles, it's upset, and it's going to collect data about what's wrong with the system, so that you've got something to look at afterwards. So first it uh, gets it into US mode so that your keyboard doesn't mess up typing things because, yeah, there's the mapping of keyboards is an issue. So it does that, and then uh, it installs curl in the, uh, the system, and then it uh, echoes stuff at... Uh, yeah, it's doing tarballs of stuff. And then it uploads them via curl, and then you end up with it in the user interface, which uh, we can probably j jump to. Are we out of time, by the uh, Next and previous results. Let's have a look. So it tells you the thing that it's upset about. Um, uh, I'll probably want to do that. And then, in the logs and assets, you get uh, yeah. I was expecting there to be more. Oh, that's yeah, the contents of var log, which might be useful. 
and a few other bits. And you can add, add that in your scripting of what happens when it fails to find something. OK, well, the very quick tour. There's loads and loads more to it. Um, yeah, the uh, the links, writing tests, that's got slightly disorganized documentation about how to write tests. Um, that's where we're running it, and that's the the tests we're running. Okay. Thanks again, Phil, and uh, 